Each year, the Oxford Dictionaries select a word of the year, a word or expression that is judged to reflect the mood of that particular year and to have a lasting potential, have a lasting potential as a word of cultural significance. Past selections include unfriend in 2009, selfie in 2013, and in 2015, this image. <laughs> yes, the word of the year for 2015 was not a word, but a pictograph, the face with toys, tears of joy emoji. Recently, the dictionaries announced that the word of the year for 2016 is post-truth, a word they define as an adjective denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. The president of Oxford, Oxford Dictionaries explained the choice this way. He said, fueled by the rise of social media as a news source and a growing distrust of facts offered up by the establish, establishment, post-truth as a concept has been finding its linguistic footing for some time. I wouldn't be surprised, he said, if post-truth becomes one of the defining words of our time. Reflecting this view, several commentators have recently asserted that we live in a post-truth world, a world in which truth has become unimportant or irrelevant. It's hard to know with certainty whether truth is really less important than it has been in the past, but it's clear that because we live in a digital age where there is so much information and so many different contending views of what is accurate, some people find that new information confounds and confuses rather than clarifies and enlightens. Modernizing the plight of the, ancient, the, the thirsty ancient mariner who proclaimed, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink, many today lament, data, data everywhere, and not a thought to think. Living in a post-truth world where there is more information available than there is time to process it presents particular challenges. Many don't know how to determine the accuracy or the truthfulness of new information. Some deal with the matter by looking for reinforcement of their pre-existing and sometimes ill-formed notions, limiting their pursuit of truth to only those sources that support their views. Stuck in an echo chamber of their own making, they stunt their ability to learn truth by sealing themselves off from any meaningful dialogue with, with any who have different viewpoints. A manifestation of this is the increasing polarization in American politics. Others go to the opposite extreme, finding any piece of information that disrupts their prior views as sufficient reason to throw aside, without further inquiry, truths that have provided guide, such sure guidance to them and others in the past. These individuals, to use the words of the Apostle Paul, are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. This tendency sometimes manifests itself as a crisis of faith, triggered by the receipt of pieces of information, true or not, that do not coincide with previously held views. Now, there are many causes for political polarization and crises of faith. One common feature, though, is that they are often a partial result of living in a post-truth world, where truth seems so difficult to discern that many may wonder whether it is worth the effort or even possible at all. My message to you today is that truth does exist. It does matter. It can be discerned. And a major part of your purpose here at BYU is to enhance your knowledge of the truth and your ability to discern it. In fact, a major part of our purpose in this mortal existence is to enhance and refine our ability to discern, apply, and ultimately internalize truth. Scriptures reveal that one of the defining characteristics of Christ and one source of His supreme power is that He is full of truth. His knowledge of all truth and His adherence to those principles gives Him all power. Indeed, He has internalized truth so well that He rightly proclaimed that He is the truth. He further declared that if we come to know the truth in its fullest sense, the truth will make us free, free to realize our full potential as sons and daughters of God and joint heirs with Christ. One of our hymns thus correctly asserts that truth is the brightest prize to which mortals or gods can aspire. To give us hope that we can eventually realize this almost incomprehensible goal of being full of truth, the scriptures make clear that Christ received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until He received a fullness. 
Thus, it is both important and possible for us to be able to discern, apply, and internalize truth despite the fact that we may be living in a post-truth world. And one of the major purposes of your education here is to progress in that manner. The BYU mission statement indicates that students at BYU should receive a broad university education. One of the principal ways we do that is through our general education requirements. Because of those requirements, most of you are familiar with this part of our mission and mission statement. However, we too often skip over the introductory phrase to that charge. BYU students are to receive a broad university education, the mission statement says, because the gospel encourages the pursuit of all truth. That statement implies at least three things. Number one, that there is such a thing as truth. Number two, that its acquisition is possible. And number three, that facilitating its pursuit is one of the purposes of this university. But all of this begs the question that Pontius Pilate put to the Savior. What is truth? We could spend well more than several devotionals pursuing that question in depth. Indeed, there are courses on this and other campuses dedicated to that very question. And philosophers have for centuries debated both the nature and the existence of truth without coming to any definite consensus. While Christ did not answer Pilate's question directly, in modern revelation he has provided both testimony that truth exists and a general definition of what it encompasses. In the 93rd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord declared, Truth is knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob echoed the same theme, observing that truth includes things as they really are and things as they really will be. That simple definition is more profound than may at first appear. For example, because it defines things as they really are, truth is not dependent on popular opinion or the assent of experts. It is, to use the scriptural phrase, independent in that sphere in which God has placed it. President Spencer W. Kimball explained it this way. The earth is spherical. If all the people in the world think it flat, they are still in error. That, that, that is an absolute truth, and all the arguing in the world will not change it. God, our Heavenly Father, lives. That is an absolute truth. All the children of men on the earth might be ignorant of Him and His attributes and His powers, but He still lives. All the people on the earth might deny Him and disbelieve, but He lives in spite of them. They may have their own opinions, but He still lives, and His form, powers, and attributes do not change according to men's opinions. In short, opinion alone has no power in the matter of an absolute truth. Truth is not only independent, it is completely comprehensive. It encompasses all knowledge, all accurate information in all worlds that ever have been or ever will be. As B. H. Roberts put it, when you say that truth is that which is, that which has been, and that which is to be in future, you make it the sum of existence. You will include the past, present, and future of all existences, their sum, and this is truth, the sum of existences, past, present, and future. Given that there are worlds or existences without number, knowledge of all aspects of each of their past, presents, and futures is vast and comprehensive. Thus, in one sense, as Elder Roberts noted, the absolute truth as set forth in the 93rd section is beyond the grasp of the finite mind. But it is incumbent upon us to learn how much of the truth we can, as much as we can, as part of our pathway to becoming like Him who embodies all truth. Brigham Young put it this way, Our religion prompts us to search diligently after knowledge. There is no other people in existence more eager to see, hear, learn, and understand truth. And this is where your current experience at BYU comes in. BYU is an educational institution, a place dedicated to the acquisition of knowledge. In the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord provides a list of things we should learn. You are familiar with it. It sounds much like the broad general education that we provide to all our students as part of our mission statement. We are to be instructed in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the law of the gospel, in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God, of things both in heaven and in the earth and under the earth, things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexities of the nations and the judgments which are on the land, and a knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms. 
That description seems to cover pretty much everything from geology to geography, from astronomy to anthropology. But note that in the middle of this list are these three subjects, things which have been, things which are, and things which must shortly come to pass. While this is not a verbatim repetition of the definition of truth in the 93rd section, it is so close that the two are surely connected. That it is embodied, embedded excuse, excuse me, in the middle of this more specific list of subjects suggests that truth is found in each of these other subjects and correspondingly that when we study any of these topics, we are engaged in the pursuit of all truth, as our mission statement challenges us to do. Thus, all courses at this university, indeed all we do at this university, should be focused on the pursuit of truth. But the pursuit of truth requires that we be able to recognize it, that we be able to distinguish information that is true from that which is not. How are we to do that, especially in a world that is increasingly post-truth? The familiar scriptural injunction that we seek learning by study and also by faith is fully applicable to this question. The role of study in the identification and acquisition of truth is more well known and widespread in universities. That is likely the primary means by which you will come to develop the skills and capacity to discern and apply truths in the subject you are studying. You will hopefully develop your capacity to think clearly and rationally about the matters put before you. That is how most students at most colleges spend most of their time, and that is how most of you will spend most of your time here. But at BYU, we are committed to the proposition that faith can also play a critical role in the recognition and acquisition of truth. Alma, dis Alma distinguishes faith from perfect knowledge, noting that faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things, but instead is a hope for things which are not seen, which are true. But this hope is not a self-created wish. It is, as described in Hebrews, the substance or the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Thus, faith seems to be a God-granted way of discerning truth before one has perfect knowledge of the matter. Faith is an extra-rational means of discerning truth through revelation. Elder Dallin H. Oaks once observed that revelation occurs when a scientist, an inventor, an artist, or great leader receives flashes of enlightenment from a loving God for the benefit of his children. I suspect that many of you have had the experience of being stuck on a problem for hours or days or even weeks or months and then having the solution come to you in a flash. I certainly have. And I can best account for the, these sudden insights by reference to Joseph Smith's description of the revelatory process in which he says, you feel pure intelligence flowing into you, giving you sudden strokes of ideas. Such revelatory experiences are greatly enhanced, as the Prophet Joseph taught, by the exercise and enhancement of our faith in Jesus Christ. The fact that faith is a lesser-known means of discerning truth should not obscure the reality that it is, in the long run, more reliable than mere rational argument, which depends on the experience and limited reasoning abilities of imperfect mortal beings. It is, after all, by the power of the Holy Ghost that we may know the truth of all things. Indeed, the most important truths can be, can be learned only by revelation based on faith. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell once explained, God's plan is not something to be deduced by logic alone, nor is human experience deep enough or long enough to inform us adequately. It requires revelation from God. While study and faith are two different tools in the process of discerning, truth and of discerning and acquiring truth, the two are interconnected in that process. For example, faith can be the initial impetus for productive study. Faith in a perfect God whose word does not fail and who created words, worlds governed by eternal laws that do not change give us an assurance that the often difficult and sometimes tedious and frustrating work of acquiring truth by study is an endeavor worth pursuing. If we truly had no belief or hope that there are ultimate answers to our questions, we would be less likely to engage in a deep, meaningful search for the answers. Faith in God can provide the hope and, in its more advanced stages, even the certainty that we are seeking for something that can be found. Similarly, study is often a prerequisite for the revelatory experience that characterizes, characterizes learning by faith. As President Spencer W. Kimball once observed, perspiration must usually precede inspiration. There must be effort before there is excellence. 
Elder Oaks explained that revelation in a particular discipline or skill is most likely to come to one who has paid the price of learning all that has been previously revealed on that subject. Discerning truth by study and by faith is not an easy process. You should not expect that if you study enough and have enough faith, you will be able to complete the process before you graduate, either from this university or, or even this mortal existence. In a post-truth environment, indeed in any mortal environment, challenges will come and questions will arise to which we don't have ready answers. How do we know in those situations what is truth, though dimly seen? Let me provide four suggestions that I believe are specific applications of the by-study and by-faith paradigm I've described. Four things that may help you better distinguish truth from falsehood and productively deal with the uncertainty inherent in the truth-seeking process. First, when you receive new information, consider the source. Some sources are more reliable than others. In the digital age, everyone has a platform. That has some upside, as it allows voices that were previously unheard to participate in the conversation that is part of the pursuit of truth. At the same time, it allows almost anyone to claim almost anything without the same fact-checking filter that has existed for many mainstream sources in the past. If the information comes from a source with which you are not familiar, both the source and the information should require more in-depth scrutiny. At one level, we all know the assertion that it's on the internet so it must be true is a false statement, but too many act as if it is true. On the flip side, there are sources of information that have a long track record of reliability and veracity. Peer-reviewed texts and articles are usually more likely to be trusted for that very reason. That is why the educational process relies so heavily upon them. More importantly, the scriptures are always reliable and always true and they serve as a measuring stick for other information. That is one reason they are called standard works. The teachings of modern prophets are similarly reliable, particularly if they are repeated over a period of time. Second, consider the context in which the information arose and the context in which it is presented. A statement may be accurately reported but still be untrue because it is taken out of context. The story is told of a candidate for election to the local school board who urged voters not to support his opponent because witnesses accurately reported that she had said that the first thing she would do would be to burn down the school. What the candidate failed to reveal is that his opponent made the statement 40 years earlier when she was unprepared for an assignment in her second grade class. Context does matter. In that regard, I urge you to evaluate new information in light of the entire plan of salvation one guiding truth that provides accurate context for all aspects of our lives. Evaluating new information in light of the plan of salvation is helpful both because it helps determine the veracity of the information and because it helps determine how important the information is. Third, be patient both with yourself and with the process. It's important to understand and remember that one purpose of our mortal experience is to learn to operate by faith to discern truth without perfect knowledge. Thus, in this life, there will never be ready answers to all our questions, despite what modern technology may cause us to think. As Elder M. Russell Ballard observed, James did not say, if any of you lack wisdom, let him Google. <laughs> Instead, God created an entire earthly experience to allow us to develop our ability to recognize and apply truth through trial and error so we can increase our ability to act by faith. Furthermore, there are likely eternal truths that we simply cannot comprehend in our current mortal and finite condition. And without all truth, we cannot answer all questions. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell once observed, sometimes we cannot make it, we, we cannot make it all add up because we don't have all the numbers. So don't be distressed if you don't find all the answers immediately. The pursuit of truth is a lifetime and likely eternal pursuit. In the meantime, hold on to what you know to be true, as Elder Holland and President Nukdorf have both implored us to do. Fourth and most important, if you want to understand truth, draw closer to him who is the source of all truth and light, who declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the life, even Jesus Christ. Every point I have made, 
the existence of truth, the definition of truth, the importance of truth, the role of study and faith in pursuing the truth, every single point rises or falls with Jesus Christ. If you have doubts about Him, that is where you need to begin the process. As President Joseph Fielding Smith once observed, the greatest truth is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world, who came into this world to die that men might live. It is far more important to know that, he said, than it is to know all that can be obtained in secular education. I close by bearing my witness that Jesus Christ lives. He is the truth. He and only He can lead you to all truth. He is anxious to bless you not only in your educational endeavors here, but in all your doings in all places at all times. If you will focus on Him in your pursuit of truth, you will succeed here and beyond. This I witness in His holy name, even Jesus Christ. Amen.